Yeah. <laughs> thank you very much uh, for introducing me. Um, I, I must also thank Camden Conference for inviting me back. Uh, I was here four years ago. Um, uh, I recall uh, my topic is about the rise of China. And uh, I try to explain this is the most ideologically charged, politically motivated Western invention uh, 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 I uh, have ever seen. So therefore, I try to criticize that concept, saying that there is a cognitive framework that is deeply rooted in European enlightenment we need to bring back. The Renaissance humanism, we need Jesuits back to. <laughs> uh, so that, that, that was my message four years ago. Now, is any improvement since then uh, on the US side in, uh, uh, when they look at China? Um, I must say probably uh, not much. And, uh, but more shockingly, uh, I must say at this stage, from a Chinese point of view, um, they are happily surprised to see that the American administration uh, managed to um, uh, perhaps misread or miscalculate uh, Russia and the China at the same time and alienate, <laughs> alienate two countries at the same time, which actually push, <laughs> no, it's purely accidental that push these two countries who historically has nothing in common, hate each other. Uh, whenever I was in Russia to give a speech, I usually start saying, you know, US, uh, China, Russian relationships at best, but I would add since Catherine the Great. Uh, meaning they never trust each other, they never understand each other. Uh, somehow they are forming some kind of very intimate, uh, in my opinion. Um, not alliance, I, I doubt there will be alliance, but uh, uh, diplomatic, economic, and geopolitical alignment uh, between the two countries. And um, my sense from the outset, my sense is that that relationship probably will last uh, much longer than Western observers tend to believe. Uh, I think, uh, especially the cliche argument about China, Russia, basically use each other. Uh, economy, you know, complement each other. Russians sell something we desperately want, meaning weapons and, and oil, gas. <laughs> and the Chinese would invest, would provide manufacturing product, manufacturing products. So the, the economy, by and the large, compatible, and they use each other. Uh, but I think that stage is uh, already uh, beyond uh, uh, reality now. W uh, r r the Russian Chinese relationship are really moving into a very different stage where they are seriously reviving a kind of diplomatic uh, uh, coordination vis-a-vis uh, -vis the West. Now, it's the good news for West or bad? Um, I'm, I wouldn't say it's necessarily a bad thing. Okay. Especially, I think, the, um, since the Ukraine crisis. Uh, what we see is that several things from the very beginning of the Ukraine crisis, the Chinese top leader react so quickly. Um, I think somebody said today Chinese remain silent. Uh, I'm, I'm a little bit surprised. The Chinese are not silent at all. The language they use, the first telephone call from President Xi Jinping to Putin is that we understand the historic context after the Crimean crisis, Xi Jinping, another call, we fully understand the complex, complexity uh, and the background of why you do this. So I, I don't see why this, by, by Chinese standard, that is very, very powerful message. Yeah. Even though at the UN uh, Security Council, uh, China, um, only uh, abstain, and uh, Ch China cannot uh, uh, publicly support what it looks like a Brezhnev doctrine, which Chinese really the, ch the chief uh, enemy during the Cold War. Right? When, when, when Soviet Union invaded uh, Czechoslovakia, Mao was so angry uh, that the relationship would deteriorate the, the next year, and uh, actually Brezhnev doctrine led to some extent directly into a military confrontation between China and Russia in 1969. Uh, because we, we fear 
of the Russians going to do with so-called brotherly countries by taking over territories. But this time, even with the Crimean crisis, Chinese feel a little bit embarrassed by this outright annexation. Uh, I think they are not invoking uh, the old sentiment uh, based on the anti-British doctrine, uh, uh, the spirit. So things are changing very rapidly uh, between China and Russia. Um, I would argue from Chinese perspective, or from Chinese leadership perspective, here I want to uh, explain briefly what in my opinion, or my, my reading, or my uh, contact, uh, are the Chinese logic of reasoning uh, concerning its relationships with Russia uh, today, especially the new leadership. This leadership was installed only about two years ago, and this is a new generation. We've been, we've been hearing a lot of talk about generational <laughs> stories. This is a very unique generation. This is a generation uh, who are in their late 50s. It's my generation, uh, who, are, uh, who grew up in the People's Republic, who who, who uh, went through the most tumultuous events uh, of the PRC history. They've been through almost everything. <laughs> uh, when they were small, in the late 50s, they went into great leap forward, which really is a great leap backwards. We, we, we have about 30 million people died of starvation thanks to Mao's uh, rather crazy uh, economic uh, policy. Um, then we went through Cultural Revolution for 10 years without high school, without universities. Uh, we were, as a former Red Guard myself, and, and, and uh, also President Xi Jinping, Li, uh, Prime Minister Li Keqiang, we the same. Uh, we all kicked out into the countryside. We were uh, forced to do uh, labor. Uh, uh, myself did four years. Uh, President Xi Jinping actually did six. Uh, you know, we've been through all these things. And then we, we come back to the city, then we are facing uh, reform, and uh, we, we begin to uh, understand, uh, have a contact with the Western world. So this is a genera generation who is not ultra-nationalist, who is not, in my view, uh, necessarily uh, uh, ideologically uh, driven uh, generation, who are uh, fundamentally uh, reformers who've been through who have seen the bottom of the society, despite uh, you know, the variety of their family background. Xi Jinping is coming from a communist veteran background, and, uh, but he stayed in the, the poorest part of China for six years. So they know China's problems. Okay. So my argument is that uh, the Chinese, this new generation leadership, look at China uh, from a much broader perspective compared with the previous generation of leadership. Jiang Zemin, Hu Jintao, or perhaps the future generation who will never have a chance to go through what uh, my generation uh, have gone through. So this is a very um, yeah, important historic moment. Uh, when you look at uh, Xi Jinping's uh, conversation with P Putin, that's the theme he always emphasized. The same age, we're more or less the same uh, generation, and we know each other. Uh, intimate better than with others, so on and so forth. Okay. So here, um, I, I think this is a very uh, important uh, historic moment for China, uh, precisely because Chinese leadership are preoccupied with several issues here. Number one is the domestic reform, uh, starting with this widespread, very deepened, very much deepened uh, anti-corruption campaigns which will have a tremendous impact on China's uh, domestic system, but also for its uh, international uh, relations for the next few years. Okay. Now, vis-a-vis -vis Russia, here I would argue this is one area uh, China and Russia are not compatible because Putin, Putin's elite or Putin uh, seem to, uh, to be robbed to be robbing the country straightforward, and uh, 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 what the Chinese corrupt officials are doing their deal with graft, rent-seeking, and many other innovative, uh, uh, seemingly commercial ways of doing things. Uh, so this is not the part of their conversation. 
in other words, even though this is a number one priority for, for the Chinese leadership today. But on global governance, on the other hand, I think China and Russia seem to be moving very rapidly closer precisely because the Western, what was perceived as a Western uh, double standard. Um, Euromaidan is, is a typical example. Uh, I, I must say, uh, we're talking about the, the current Ukraine government being elected, democratic elected government. Yanukovych is not. Uh, what, what does that mean? Uh, uh, no matter who overthrew uh, uh, Yanukovych, but uh, why the Western countries uh, immediately recognize uh, a, a democratic leader who were uh, overthrown? How about Egypt? How about, you see, since the Arab Spring, Chinese are very much obsessed with this idea whether or not this kind of thing will take place in China. So you can say, well, there is a certain sense of panic. Yeah. Uh, this is the uh, argument uh, uh, they cannot accept. Uh, they, they cannot uh, uh, agree to that you, you can have two different standards as, as far as political legitimacy is concerned. Yeah. Now, here again, I think the key issue is legitimacy. How do you define legitimacy? Yeah. Um, the Chinese leaders, I, I think, uh, the, in their mindset today is they are not talking about rise of China. Uh, once again, I repeat my old thesis, that's your invention. The, 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 the phrase they use is restoration or re-rise maybe, but never rise of China, because we've been there before. <laughs> Enormous amount of surplus of trade, huge accumulation, hard currency. Well, we've been there since uh, up until 1820s. Chinese economy is, uh, as a single economy, is still number one. Uh, Chinese economy is 32.9 of global GDP. It's not something we haven't seen before. Chinese never know trade deficit uh, since a millennia, because there is no deficit there. So they are talking about restoration of our own culture, restoration of the Chinese own governance model. At the same time, the Western countries seem to them try to impose a single standard according to Western uh, Christian, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the, value, West, the, the Western value based on the uh, liberal democracy as the only um, standard for judging legitimacy. Now, I, I don't think this is uh, uh, an ideology that can be uh, acceptable. Yeah. So in that sense, when the Euromaidan happened, this is immediate reaction from Chinese leaders is we cannot let that stand. Okay. So it's not something uh, tactical. Uh, just for reasons uh, appease, uh, appeasing Putin. Okay. So there is a real debate. There is a real argument there. We are returning to, according to our leadership in China, returning to Confucian concept of legitimacy, which is not a, a procedure-based concept. Procedure means you divide power into spaces. Therefore, you have, you know, divisions of power, Montesquieu's old uh, uh, theme, uh, which is very much American theme as well. At the same time, you, you can even divide, since French Revolution, of course, the, the Western invention is to divide people into different categories by directions, space, right wing, you know, left wing. That's only took place after the French Revolution. Don't forget, it's not even part of Western tradition. It's invented by European Enlightenment. So that what Chinese want is to resume a conversation with, the, as I said, with the Renaissance humanists represented by Jesuits uh, 400 years ago, where they don't treat Chinese system as being legitimate at all, because they think the European system at that time it's much less legitimate than Chinese system. Um, I think the European system is totally corrupt. Now, happily, we have a Jesuit uh, now uh, finally run, uh, the running the uh, Vatican. Um, 
I, I, promise, I promise you the breakthrough is coming <laughs> between China and the Vatican. Yes, I'm serious because I was, <laughs> yes, I was involved in part of that. So, how about geopolitical? Here, uh, maybe I'm talking a little bit too much on the more uh, history and the, and the theology. Um, um, but how about geopolitics? Now, the Russian relationship today fits very well with China's strategy known as Euro-Asian strategy, which they started in 2003. Okay. Now, that is a very important historic moment. Um, when the Ukraine crisis came, I, uh, I was perhaps the only one who wrote this column in, in the newspaper in Hong Kong, South China Morning Post. I say maybe this is the beginning of a revival of Entente Active, which appeared in 2003, anti-Iraqi bloc. Uh, that, that probably we're going to have a chance to revive that. Of course, everybody said that's nonsense. But I do see something like that. Uh, slowly uh, brewing, and uh, we are talking about the goal stream of Europe defined as from, you know, during the Cold War period, from Atlantic Ural, but now extend all the way to Euro con uh, Euro-Asian continent, to East China Sea, where we have uh, Moscow, Beijing, Berlin, and, and uh, Paris, who are not necessarily in agreement with the uh, American uh, way of thinking about the global governance. So in that sense, I think China took this as a very important opportunity uh, of reviving uh, its uh, uh, potential dream uh, of this uh, new diplomatic entente. Now, remember, China used not to take uh, European Union very seriously until 2003. Uh, because Chinese don't like European Union. I don't like European integration. They don't understand it. We, we had a delegation with the uh, EC since the early 70s, but nobody wants to, to be there. We don't understand. Too complicated. It's, it's a benign Byzantine system. You know, nothing going to happen. So Chinese always worry about you know, They don't like During the Cold War period, Chinese reputation is called G1 country because they don't, they don't want any multilateral thing. <laughs> Um, if we talk to our diplomats in those days, <laughs> up until the 90s, you know, if assignment to Geneva, this multinational setting is a kiss of death to their career. <laughs> but now, now everybody wants that kind of job to start. You know, they say, well, we need multinational experience. EU is a shining example for China, really, yeah, because this is the only Western part, uh, only part of the West that moved, seemed to China moved beyond itself, meaning the Westphalian rules of the game, <laughs> you know, based on power fighting each other. Uh, Chinese did not convince, uh, they are not convinced until 2003, during that Iraq, Iraqi debate. Now, it's not well known, 2004, the Politburo actually designated 2004 the year of the EU. So that's the beginning of a very rapid uh, strategic uh, relationship uh, developed between China and the EU. And the China now treat EU as a uh, top priority, of course, with Germany now taking the lead. We're talking about the Russian uh, Merkel special relationship, but uh, I would much, uh, very much uh, uh, draw your attention to see what, how special the relation between China and the Germany <laughs> the last few years. Yeah. Uh, so here, I think the China is uh, pursuing a westward strategy, uh, also called uh, Euro-Asian strategy, trying to build bridges because the western part of China, I'm talking about Euro-Asia, I'm talking about uh, uh, EU itself, I'm talking about Russia, the three bridges have been built slowly but very quietly and uh, we have Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, we have a China-Russian special relationship today, then we have a uh, strategic partnership with EU for more than 10 years now. Okay. EU is China's number one economic partner, surpassing the United States, and uh, uh, certainly surpassing that of Japan. So it's not something uh, abstract just because the uh, Europeans are nicer than Americans. Because the, p the east side, the Pacific side of China is a muddy water Chinese prefer not, not to get too much <laughs> involved. 
Uh, unfortunately, as I, tr uh, as I said at the very beginning, uh, somehow Obama managed to muddy that water from, again, sitting in Beijing. That's what they think. Uh, for otherwise rather Pacific, Pacific. <laughs> uh, uh, um, Sankakus, for example. Is that an issue? Uh, nobody heard about Sankaku. <laughs> right? um, I, I'm, sh I'm sure most Americans never heard about Sankakus a few years ago. Why did that become a top issue between China, Japan, and the United States? Okay. South China Sea, okay. there is another problem. Yeah. We have Hillary Clinton went to Philippines, says West Philippine Sea. Um, you know, all these gestures I don't think make much sense. Um, my understanding is uh, Hillary probably just learned the Philippines call it West West. He just used it one hour later. I heard a lot of criticism of her uh, from the congressional leaders, but uh, um, I don't know what, what's, what's the purpose for. Okay. So I, I put it this way, this Russian relationship fits very well with this China's attempt at the soft landing for the future potential integration into international system via Euro-Asian bridge. That has been the strategy since 2003. Yeah. Um, and it seemed to be working. It seemed to be working. Now, economically, I, I, I think you know a lot already, not just the oil and the gas. Here, oil gas issue and the arms sales, uh, trade uh, aside, I want to, again, draw your attention to what is the top priority in Chinese leaders these days in Beijing. Uh, as President Xi Jinping announced in uh, uh, 2013 uh, in Bishkek, uh, September 13, I think September 13, uh, uh, in Bishkek, uh, of establishing uh, SCO, Shanghai Cooperation Organizations, uh, training center and, uh, and a leading think tank. Uh, this is known in China as a presidential project studying a topic known as a new Silk Road. Now, <laughs> um, they already established a major bank. Now today, I must say, I'm a little disappointed. Uh, the, the Russian issue, Ukraine issue, is put in the context transatlantic. OK, this is the United States. I understand transatlantic issue. But uh, it, it is a global. Where is the SCO uh, in this picture? Where, where is the... Uh, the uh, 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 BRICS in this picture. Russians have other affiliations, which are very important. BRICS Bank, for example, now it's a capital, capitalization bigger than World Bank. The, the most recent bank for the new Silk Road is called Asian Infrastructure Bank, which now already taking shape, where the TPP, TTIP, all those fancy con uh, concepts haven't even taken off. Uh, uh, it's already there. <laughs> since December of, uh, of APEC meeting in Beijing, when President Obama also uh, there. Okay. So there is a very powerful moment now for a Euro-Asian economic integration. So I, I don't really think it's, it's a simple issue that uh, uh, we heard today saying that the Chinese are extraordinarily cunning, uh, astute, uh, uh, they are squeeze every blood of the Russians when the Russians make a deal. Okay, yeah, they are not bad in do doing business, but on the other hand, <laughs> no, I, I would argue, on the other hand, geopolitical interests today for China, I mean, long-term, including this economic long-term interest of building a Silk Road concept uh, uh, to realize that dream, uh, because that will solve China's own economic Pro, at, at least in their mind, right? S uh, help deal with their own economic structural problems. The Silk Road is not just for diplomacy. Okay. So this is something China is willing to help Russia if Russia is running into financial difficulties. I, again, I draw your attention, the Prime Minister Li Keqiang in Moscow, he actually was embarrassed and he asked Putin, saying, if you have a financial problem, you cannot pay, we can help you. And Putin is too proud to even, you know, to, to, to answer that, which embarrasses for, 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 for Prime Minister Li Keqiang. Um, China more than anxious uh, of keep Russian economy alone, <laughs> uh, afloat. It's not just for the purpose of uh, gas and, uh, and oil. Uh, there is a long-term 
a strategic plan. So here I think the, uh, uh, the, the, the Russian-Chinese uh, relationship are really uh, reaching a stage where uh, become very comprehensive and they, they have uh, uh, established a lot of institutions. They are doing a lot of things the European uh, integration process are doing, which is institution building, personality uh, uh, connections, and um, uh, as I say, the, the, you know, the first training center for uh, for SCO uh, office, office is now set in Shanghai the, the, for the Silk Road uh, project. Uh, I'm happily being asked to run that project myself. I haven't started yet, by the way. <laughs> Have not started. <laughs> I'm supposed to go back in May. Uh, uh, for the Silk Road uh, stuff, so um, so I think it's it's a very um, I think the, uh, the the relationship between Russia and China uh, is no longer what it seems. Now, do they have limitations? There is no doubt there are limitations. I think that the, the main uh, problem is from a China's perspective is the uh, Putin's way of conducting diplomacy. You have to understand Putin had enormous reputation in China, no matter what. Uh, 66, persistently, this is not official government propaganda, this is a real poll. Uh, consistently over 66% and uh, middle-aged woman's dream husband, that's, you know. <laughs> no, you, you, you go to China, you ask them. <laughs> I'm not exaggerating. So I'm not as, <laughs> okay. You don't like him, but I, I don't like him either, but I'm just saying, this is what, um, now what Chinese really concerned is the, uh, the imperial instinct and the extraordinary uh, cunning uh, of, the, of a Russian diplomacy. Somebody said today the Russians may not have a long-term uh, game, but from a Chinese point of view, Russia has been in the European diplomacy for many, many centuries. It is China who doesn't know how to do great power politics. Uh, as you know, we proposed to President uh, Obama several times, new type of great power relationship. Uh, Obama never really take it too seriously because, well, first of all, Chinese never figure out what is great power in our language. <laughs> no, truly. There are three versions, foreign ministry had one. You know, they don't know how to define. What, what do you mean great power in Chinese language? You have to make that clear. They cannot. You see, the, the, between US and China, they always try to come up with some overarching phrases, fantasies, but never really, nothing really worked, right? Think about it. The only thing that worked is Henry uh, Kissinger's uh, strategic uh, ambiguity. I mean, otherwise, nothing else. Robert Zolik, remember the responsible stakeholder? Uh, think about uh, the Chinese peaceful rice, which is killed. Um, then, um, what? Steinberger uh, strategic reassurance goes nowhere, maybe last two months. Uh, um, now you have uh, China raise the, you know, uh, propose a new type of great power. But with Russia, however, the communication, we understand very well with each other. What the Chinese really puzzled is, it seems to the Chinese leader, Russians know your language, know Westphalian logic. Putin simply say things is so basic in the Westphalia system, yet you still willing to screw him up. Uh, <laughs> No, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really talking about policy elite. You know, when we, we were in Beijing, when we were talking, I said, what, what is this? <laughs> it's unbelievable uh, how the West be that clumsy. Uh, are you kidding? I mean, NATO expansion, nothing to do with the Russians. Are you kidding? The triumphalism after the Cold War basically said, well, the Russians defeated. Um, Francis Fukuyama nonsense, uh, all that. Um, so I think, you know, f from a China point of view, it, we need to learn from the Russians. They know how to deal with the West. We don't know. See, this is, so what Chinese leader, okay, I'm, uh, uh, I think I'm in the last uh, a minute. I simply want to say what Chinese trying to do with Russia, which they have done before, is they are going back, surprisingly, to also to 400 years ago, almost 400 years ago, not with the Jesuits. 
because we are not dealing with Jesuits in Russia. There, there is no red Jesuits. We are dealing with uh, the Catherine Great. We, we are dealing with uh, Peter the Great, who was still a teenager. We had the first China's first ever international treaty, which is under very serious study. That is a treaty that is not Westphalian treaty. That's not imposed upon us by the British because of the open war. This is the Treaty of Nechinsk. Now, that's a great power game. That's a real great power achievement. Okay. Now, this is where the, the, the future Sino-Russian relationship, it looks like it's a win-win situation. Uh, 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 I think the Russian leaders and Chinese always complain one thing. We have settled, we have 7,700 border dispute as a legacy between <laughs> China and Russia. Somehow only seven and a half left. Well, nobody give us Nobel Peace Prize. <laughs> nobody paid <attention. laughs> Well, Obama hasn't done much, right? So he already got one. So sorry to say, I, I, I cannot subscribe to this uh, uh, anti-Russian sentimentalism as such, even though I'm very much wary about Russian uh, diplomacy itself. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.